by recording WBJCFM presents Inside Gene Shepherd. the other day, believe it or not, he was having a clearance. It says, buy early for your Easter card selection. Easter. No, I'm not kidding you, man. Uh, buy early for Easter. <laughs> They've leapfrogged Christmas, Thanksgiving, the whole works. <laughs> oh, the, no wonder people are having trouble with time these days. You know, one of the great problems that face most of us these days, I mean, when I say us, I'm talking about the editorial us here, is the is the sense that time is some kind of a ravaging wolf that is pursuing us at an ever-increasing rate. I wonder how much of it has to do with the commercial world. Oh, yes, already I've seen pictures in the, in newspapers what the 76 cars are going to look like. Have you seen those? <laughs> Guys, what do you mean, 76 and 76 already? What are you talking about? And... Uh, uh, your head, your head just can't absorb absorb all that uh, giant amounts of time that quickly. Uh, I know people who, uh, uh, by late July, have already completed their Christmas shopping. You know, they're living six months in advance, and uh, yes, and they're already mad that this Christmas didn't turn out as well as last Christmas. You know, Christmas is already <laughs> in their head, over and done with. <laughs> and the real one, of course, is just a, a kind of an anticlimax. And after Christmas, they immediately start, by that time, already preparing for their vacation, their summer vacation. They start laying in stuff, you know, oh, wow, you know. So naturally, time uh, is a, well, I, I go down to my bank the other day, see, and the guy says, hey, he said, uh, he's a bank, you know, very official people. And he said, say, we'd like to give you a little gift since you're such a valued customer here. And of course, I noticed he was giving them all the valued customers that came in there. And I said, yes, what is it? He said, well, uh, we have a perpetual calendar that's good till the year uh, 2010, and I think you'll find it very valuable. And the next thing I know, I've got a calendar that says the year 2010 on it. Have you have you looked at a calendar that's at the top? It says 2010. That's very weird. <laughs> and it has Monday and Wednesday. You never think in terms of, say, the year 2750 as having actual Wednesdays. You know, there's a little red one that says Easter. You can't imagine them celebrating Easter in the year 2790. You know, the Easter bunny comes hopping along. Or uh, Thanksgiving, and you have... I suppose by the year 2010, though, turkeys will have long since disappeared from the face of the earth. And we'll have a symbolic turkey uh, that uh, we will have, you know, just like... <laughs> I don't know. I've got the calendar, and it's good for all those years. And uh, I suppose owning a calendar like this gives one a sense of uh, security that one will reach 2010. Oh, yes, you have a calendar. There it is. It's right in your pocket. Absolutely. And I think the reason that everybody likes to live very much in the future, yes, I know a guy who's 87 years old, and he went down and he tried to get a 35-year mortgage. And uh, the guy says, you sure? <laughs> He didn't think, didn't think there was anything wrong with it. <laughs> so, uh, would you please, if you will, let's uh, let's sing a little song here to get the to get the ashes stirred around down the basement. Let's sing it out, gang. 
What the hell? We're all going to live forever, aren't we? Yeah. Oh, the bear missed the train. Keep it up there, boy. The bear missed the train. Yeah, the bear missed the train. And now he's walking. Boom, 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 boom. The bear missed the train. Oh, the bear missed the train. Oh, the bear missed the train. And now he's walking. He's walking near. Uh, and he's walking near. <laughs> he's walking. And look at him. He's drinking a glass of beer. Yeah, the bear missed the train. Oh, the bear missed the train. Oh, the bear missed the train. And now he's walking. Look at who work right now. <laughs> up everything in it you know hey did anybody anyone out there ever hear of the gravity hill mystery no i just just asking you this as a as an editorial question you don't immediately call up and ask you mean you don't know what's going on in shellsburg pennsylvania oh there's mysteries everywhere man and uh i am the last guy to discount the idea of the jersey devil oh i don't discount that I don't discount the Jersey Devil. As a matter of fact, I, I, I'm also a man who believes that uh, somewhere there's a rolling calf. You ever hear of the rolling calf? You never heard of that? Well, you'd have to go to Jamaica to hear of that. You don't know about the rolling calf. Well, you know what the rolling calf is? I'll tell you what the rolling calf is. I'll tell you what you do. Would you do this for me, Mark? You go out into the next room, and if you find Corny there, you just go right out now and just say to him, uh, rolling calf. And at that point, uh, you drag Corny out from under the desk where he will be hiding. And, uh, <laughs> no, I don't put down the Jersey Devil. I, I, I really don't because I, I, uh, you know, just like uh, a lot of people, like Long John always says, uh, I ain't going to believe it. But on the other hand, I'm not going to laugh at it either. Um, uh, yeah, you woke him up there, didn't you? You woke him up, right? That's right, and uh, I'm surprised that you don't know what the rolling calf is. Well, well, uh, there's a lot of theories about what the rolling calf really is, but the rolling calf is, let's put it this way, it's distilled total evil, deadly evil, and it has, it has bright glowing eyes like a bright headlight, and it comes out of the darkness across a field, and if you ever see the rolling calf coming towards you out of the darkness, it's just all over. It's done. No one has ever survived seeing the rolling calf. It's just done. And, and if you're ever driving along in the Pine Barrens of Jersey, and suddenly you see this great light approaching you out of the woods, uh, with the, apparently with the, with the nostrils that snort fire and flame, it's gone. I mean, even if you're on your Pinto, it's gone. It's all done. That's the Jersey Devil. Now, a lot of you probably think that you work for the Jersey Devil. Well, that's quite possibly true. There may be a little Jersey Devil in your boss. I don't know. But uh, I, I, I'll just give you a, an account of the kind of mysterious things that go on. Are you ready now? This is a scary type show. Here is one that you just... All right, now I want you to give me a theory on this. You ready for it? Okay, this is from Shellsburg, Pennsylvania. You know anything about Pennsylvania? Pennsylvania is one of the solid rock-bound states. I mean, these are no-nonsense people, right? Pennsylvania people. 
Uh, oh, yes, uh, the Amish and the whole bit, you know, the Pennsylvania Dutch. Pennsylvania is, is a solid state. Oh, practically everything's made out of rock in Pennsylvania. You drive around the houses, everything, people, heads, the whole thing made out of rock. And uh, there's nothing more solid than the Pennsylvania Turnpike. The Pennsylvania Turnpike is a turnpike among turnpikes. You ever been on it? Do you agree with that? It's the big daddy of all turnpikes. It may not be the biggest, may not be the widest, but it's got presence. It's there, man. That's a turnpike. And you see that side coming up out of the darkness as Harrisburg, 12 miles. Huh? You're heading west, right? Or if you see the sign coming up out of the darkness and, and the, the sign says, Philadelphia, Chester, you're heading east, right? That's the turnpike. It's Pennsylvania. It's a solid rock state. Well, listen to what's happening in Shellsburg, Pennsylvania. You just listen to this. An eerie phenomenon which sees cars unaccountably being drawn up. Yes, up, and I repeat it, up a hill near the small central Pennsylvania town of Shellsburg in Bedford County has recently been revealed. Cars are being drawn uphill in that town. Known as Gravity Hill by the natives of the nearby mountain communities who say they have been aware of this mysterious force for many years, this enigma is attracting more and more people to the spot. The once lonely Bethel Hollow Road at the foot of the Allegheny Mountains about five miles east of Shawnee State Park is rapidly becoming a mecca for the curious, students of the occult, and engineers. All have taken the backward, the backward ride and have gone away terrified. Do you hear that? The backward, backward ride. Uh, a reporter, this is the reporter that writes this thing, it says, uh, it says the other day an unbelieving reporter and a Mercer County engineer accompanied John Sellers, warden of the Bedford County Jail, and his wife Catherine, who is also a deputy, to the site where the foursome, the people, this is the reporter and the engineer, not only rode but walked on Gravity Hill and came away convinced that it is not an optical illusion, but rather, at least for now, a perplexing study in the mysterious. Want to hear what happens out there? At the crest of the gently sloping hill, Warden Sellers, while traveling almost 30 miles per hour, shifted the gears into neutral and began a descent of the 400-foot grade. Almost immediately, the car slowed down. Now remember, he's heading down this hill, see? He's got the car going. He's going 30 miles an hour, roughly. He's going down a hill. Now, you got the picture in your mind? He shifts to neutral. Well, what happens to a car when you shift it to neutral, going 30 miles an hour to start with, down a hill? What happens? That's right. You coast down. You generally pick up speed, if anything, you know. The 30 miles, you're certainly not going to slow up. You put it in the, in, the, in the neutral at 30 miles an hour heading down a hill, the car's got to pick up speed. But what happened? Almost immediately, the car began to slow. It came to a gradual halt about halfway down the hill. It stopped. And then began a backward climb reaching about 10 miles per hour by the time that the vehicle had reached the crest of the hill. It went back up the hill. Okay, friends? The trip was then reversed, and at the bottom of the grade, sellers traveling less than five, mi five miles an hour again shifted into neutral. And this time the car... Uh, the ascending auto gained the momentum until it easily reached and crossed the brow of the hill. Did you figure that out? It's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> a slight backward pull on the passengers while ascending, they were, you know, would rule out the optical illusion theory, which is advanced by some, a theory disproved by engineers who have surveyed the gravity-defying stretch of road. Nobody knows what the heck's going on. A walk down the hill gives a sensation of an upward climb. In other words, when you walk down the hill, you get a feeling like you're going up because it's hard to walk down the hill. It's wild. And one feels as if 
you know, <laughs> while climbing the hill. And then when you climb the hill, in other words, if you turned up, turned around and went back up the hill, it goes up very easily. It's like you're descending. It's wild. Just as perplexing, though, is that while Gravity Hill drops to the valley floor in a northeasterly direction, a mountain stream that parallels the sloping roadway flows south, which, which according to all accepted laws of gravity is an impossibility. Okay. Bedford County natives insist that this entire area in the foothills of the Alleghenies is rife with many unsolved mysteries, such as the huge underground lake beneath Chestnut Ridge nearby, and an underground river which supplies the waters for the state fish hatchery at uh, Reynoldsdale, some four miles away, the underground lake would appear to be a reality since a drill bit dropped from sight uh, never was recovered while a gas company was engaged in a gas drilling project out there a few years ago. The inexplicable forces that have revealed or have reversed the laws of gravity on Bethel Hollow Road, however, will be listed as one of nature's phenomenon, at least until someone comes up with an answer. There it is. If you're curious where this place is, it's Shellsburg, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and Well, there has to be some kind of physical uh, explanation of it, but nevertheless, there it is. It defies the laws of, of known physical nature. In other words, the cars go back up the hill, and that's a lot of weight in a car when there's four people sitting in it, and it just goes right back up the hill at about 10 miles an hour. That's a pretty good speed, too since it was going 30 on the way down. Wow. Well, now, have you ever been around an underground lake? Have you ever been around an underground river? Well, you know that there's two major underground streams that flow under Manhattan. You didn't know that. Well, one of them is in the vicinity of Murray Hill. And in fact, on ancient old maps, that's redundant, but uh, <laughs> on ancient maps of uh, the area of Murray Hill and of Manhattan, the island of Manhattan, when it was a Dutch island many, many years ago, uh, back before this country was a country, back in the 1600s, shows a stream running right over Murray Hill, which would be in the 30s here, out of the East River. There's a hill that comes, or rather a stream that runs through there. And uh, that, that stream still exists, but it's underground now. And for those of you who don't know anything about underground rivers, you know, it's, it's, uh, I was up in Michigan one time. I'll never forget talking about fantastic phenomenon. i never forget this scene all my born days. One of, the, one of the truly eerie things that have ever happened to me in my life uh, that has to do with phenomenon. I, I was in a cabin on a lake in central Michigan. Now, if you have a map of Michigan, you will find many, many lakes throughout that whole area, up uh, up around Bay City and Saginaw, that whole central Michigan area. And it was a kind of wild country at that time, very wild area around there. It was a, a heavy pine and, and uh, evergreen forest and uh, lakes just dotting the country. So it's glacial country there. And these are stone lakes, cold too. And uh, by the Oh, I'd say by October, uh, already there's snow and the wind. And in fact, I was up there in October. There were millions of deer up there. That's a great deer state. And uh, I was not hunting. I'm not a hunter type. But I was in this cabin, and I was, I was fishing. And I was alone. That's what added to it. And it was cold. It was, oh, I'd say the temperature was dropping down to, uh, at night, it would drop down. It was early October. The temperature would drop down in the 20s at night. And it was beginning winter. And in the daytime, it was always uh, windy and blowing, and the, the trees were, were brown, and, and there were choppy, uh, choppy waves on the lake. And it was, it was a very dramatic country, which added to the thing that happened later, was the dramatic quality of the country itself. And I'd been there about two or three days, and this was in a small cabin, which I had rented from a farmer. It was right on the lake, and there was nothing around this cabin. There were no cabins near it at all. It was just a cabin, and it had a fireplace in it, and that's the way he heated this place. And uh, it had kerosene lamps, by the way, which was part of the thing that happened later. It didn't have electricity that came down to it. And it was right near the shore of the lake, and it was kind of a marshy area to my left, 
that had lily pads, and uh, it was a good bass area. But actually, this, the fish that were in this lake were mostly northern pike and a few muscalunge, but mostly northern pike. And they're kind of a big, mean, mysterious fish anyway. And so this, I was there, going to be there for 10 days. <laughs> and, and it was, it was, oh, it was really cold. And uh, it was kind of great. I mean, really fantastic. I remember I had an MG. I was driving an MG TD, in case you're curious what kind of a car it was. It was a, the TD MG. And it was a great car. And uh, I, I'd drive it around on the gravel roads there. Look at the old farmhouses that were that were deserted and that had been abandoned many years before. You know, when I look back, I left a lot of stuff around there, but here was the these old farmhouses just sinking into the into the uh, the reeds and the grass. These are farmhouses that had been built many, many years ago, like in 1890 or 1880, and they were slowly sinking. They'd been deserted and gone. It was rough, really rough farm country. Nobody could really grow much around there because it was too rocky and mean. And so, but they tried, you know. There were there were there were remnants of old apple orchards there, where these people had tried to grow apples, and the apples would drop to the ground, and deer would come at night, and uh, eat these apples. They love apples that are that have dropped, and uh, incidentally, the apples would often ferment, and uh, as they would drop, you know, after all, an apple is laying on the ground there, and it would begin to get soft and then start to ferment, and the deer love fermented apples. And just for the same reason that people love fermented apples <laughs> and fermented grape. <laughs> we don't eat the whole apple. We squeeze it and put it in the bottles. But uh, they didn't have bottles, so they just eat the whole apple, see? And they would come out. And uh, one of the things they warned you about in that area was that uh, if certain, and this was at this time of year, which was mating season, incidentally, for the deer, uh, that uh, if, uh, if, if a buck came down... Uh, out of the uh, lake area around there and and ran into a lot of fermented apples. It became very dangerous that the beer, just like, well, you know, you've known a klutz or two in your life. Give him a couple of, uh, uh, you know, a couple of uh, fingers of bourbon. He gets a snootful and he wants to fight everybody in the bar. And he has no chance whatsoever of ever beating anybody. But he can cause a lot of trouble, right? I mean, next thing you know, you before you throw Heine out, you know, he's broken some bottles and knocked the tables over and made a hell of a scene, you know, and the police have to come. Well, that's what happens to deer. The deer is ordinarily a very uh, uh, skittish, nervous animal. You can't get near, especially a buck. You don't see many bucks. You know, they, they're deep forest creatures. The doe will come out a lot, and most of the deer that you see when you're driving around are doe. Uh, occasionally yearlings, you know, a little fawn or something, but you don't see many, many bucks. You agree? Well, but that changes <laughs> when when the buck comes down and gets a half a peck of fermented apples. He doesn't run away anymore. He comes to look for people. You know, all that all that anger comes out. And he says, "Damn it!" He says, "I've been taking this junk too long for them damn people." And he comes he comes out looking around for you. And be careful because they are mean, especially when he's got a couple of big prongs hanging on the front there. You know, he's got those things. That's the biggest tuning fork you ever saw, buddy. And it'll go through your liver so quick you won't know what happened. And uh, he'll he'll come out and look for you. So they said, watch out for the deer. So it's kind of a scary place. And I'd hear them once in a while in the dark out there. And you go out back of the cabin to get some wood. And you carry this big flashlight. Because if you don't, uh, he will see a shadow in the dark. And they will hit. They will, they will charge. May, mostly because they think it's another deer. Uh, usually another buck hanging around looking for the does. And he'll come at you. So you carry this light. Well, if you carry the light out in the darkness, you, you flash it around, you can see these great big eyes looking at you. And uh, have you ever seen the eyes of a deer looking at you from maybe 30 feet away in the beam of a, of a searchlight? Well, they're, they're round, almost completely round. It's eerie. It's like they've got a light inside of them. Uh, they, they generate their own light. And you see these two lights looking at you, see. And uh, you'll hear him snort once in a while. <clears throat> you know, he'll snort. And uh, if he, if those lights start getting bigger, well, the best thing to do is to... <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, at this time of the year, the best thing to do is to turn around and make one fantastic dive for the screen door, uh, in which case he's liable to come through it. Now, uh, you, but you have a better chance of hitting the screen door than hitting you. 
So uh, nevertheless, that's generally what's done. Often, too, what you will do is throw the light off to one side, so he will, he will pursue the light. And then you make your way as fast as you can to town. Now, uh, <laughs> you're usually running like hell because you can't get your car started in time. But the deer can be mean animals, especially if uh, it's, it's that season, the rutting season. And uh, they're looking for action. They'll look for any kind of action. And at night, you can hear the deer often fighting. Oh, yeah, you hear those horns going together, man, and you know that it's better to stay right there next to the fireside reading the Sears Roebuck catalog. So, uh, nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless uh, all right, you got the picture, okay? So, Shepard's in this cabin and all around him. And, and, uh, you know, it's not scary. It's only scary. I mean, it's scary if it's in your head. There's nothing out there really dangerous. Of course, once in a while, you'd hear a bobcat. There are a lot of bobcats in that area. Have you ever heard of bobcat? They don't have bobcats down on the islands, do they? Well, a bobcat is a bobcat. He's called a bobcat because his tail is bobbed. He's got a short tail, you know, and it's a bobcat. He's got these little tufts on his ears, and uh, I've seen many a bobcat in that area. You see them occasionally in Michigan, but they are of Maine, but there are really much more of them in Michigan, and occasionally up in that area. Uh, there is an occasional wandering wolf. Uh, they're rare, but there are a few, uh, very few, and occasional bear, but you don't see those much either. But you do see the bobcats, and so at night you hear the bobcat occasionally let go a scream out there in the uh, swamps. That's enough to make you put the Sears Roebuck catalog down thoughtfully for a couple of seconds, you know. <laughs> and they don't, you know, they're little, really, comparatively, as animals go, but fierce as hell. Pound for pound, I would say the bobcat is one of the meanest creatures in the world. Pound for pound. Next to the barracuda. Uh, now, he doesn't come after you, but the danger of a bobcat is occasionally uh, when... when uh, you're, you're messing around in the woods for some reason or other, and you reach your hand down into a hole. Now, uh, why you would be doing this is a reason of your own making. But if you do, and, and there is a bobcat in that hole, he will take immediate countermeasures, which is likely to say you ain't got no thumb. <laughs> I mean, he'll climb right up your arm, man, and start on your ear. So... Uh, no, yeah, with a wild scream. They have a wild scream, too. Do you want to hear how Bobcat sounds? He has a built-in echo chamber. Can you make, give me a little echo chamber in there? Ah! That's all he does. <laughs> and then he has a, has a mewing sound. Meow! He goes, meow! Meow! And uh, you hear a few of those, and uh, you know, you get so you're kind of used to that. And so... Three days uh, in the cabin there, everything is fine. It's very dark at night. It gets so dark you couldn't believe it. Uh, there were no lights around there, and uh, at night uh, there were no, no other boats on the on the lake. You see, I was the only guy that was fishing, and I was the only one on that lake. Uh, the farmer owned this whole country around there, you see. That's the, what made later the curious mystery develop into what it was, because he owned that lake. The lake was on his farm. He had something like 500 acres up there. Uh, of mostly woodland, and uh, maybe a hundred acres were in some kind of uh, trees. I think he had peaches or possibly apples up there. They weren't peaches, they were apples. They grow cherries up there too, a certain kind of cherry. And uh, they had vines, they grow uh, certain types of uh, of uh, grape there. Was, uh, they, they, one of the great drinks, incidentally, in America that you never find out here east, but you do find in that area up there, is cherry cider. Now, most of you are used to apple cider. Well, they also make cherry cider. Have you ever had cherry cider? Well, <laughs> that's a very interesting drink because it is cherry cider. It's cider made out of cherry juice instead of apple juice. It makes a very interesting drink. It's a dark red. It looks like, almost like uh, like uh, cranberry juice is really what it looks like. You've seen cranberry juice. This is a, a dark red drink. Now, they also make out of that, many of the farmers, you've heard the term applejack. Well, do you know what the difference between apple jack and apple cider is? You don't. Well, there is a big difference. Apple jack is a, is a very alcoholic drink. It will literally knock the back of your head off. Apple jack. So it's, it's, apple, it's, a, it's apple liquor is what it really is. It's, a, it's fermented, and it's made into a liquor, and it's, it's called apple jack. Now, apple cider is just, you know, 
vaguely fermented apple juice is what apple cider is. It's slightly fermented. Give it a little more fermentation, and you have hard cider. Then you work a little more on it, and you got applejack. And then you start having fist fights. And it just has that progression. Well, well, there is a thing in the in the cherry world like that. There's cherry juice, then there's cherry cider, then there's hard cherry cider, and then there's cherry jack. Now, cherry jack is the stuff that the old uh, the old time uh, woodsmen used to drink up there. These are, this is Paul Bunyan type country up there, and these guys would go out and on a Saturday night they would drink a gallon and a half of cherry jack. And then look out. First of all, all these guys are seven feet two, and uh, they're <laughs> you know, and they're mean. They all carry their axe with them. So uh, it's an interesting combination. Now I'm t I'm telling you about true Americana. You uh, and this is not about the old days. This is still there. You can still buy cherry cider all through Michigan, and if you know the right guys, cherry Jack. Uh, and uh, there are still lumbermen up there too and there are still lakes up there so none of this is and their deer are even more up there now than ever before so now i'll tell you i'm gonna this is gets gets to be scary because I, I it was a scary moment for me all of us have had curious moments in our life and, and reading about that gravity hill you know nobody could explain it and you don't believe it. I'm, I'm sure that you're listening to this story. You say, oh, yeah, that's one of those apocryphal stories. But no, actually, that's happening in Shellsburg, Pennsylvania. There it is. Well, all right. It was about 10.30, 11 o'clock at night. This was the middle of the week. And it was, it was, it was, uh, it was towards the middle of the week that I began to notice this. A curious thing. I'm out on the lake. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's in the middle of the afternoon. I'm out there in this canoe. The wind is blowing. It's colder than hell. I mean, really cold. It was right on the edge of freezing. And I'm using a silver spoon. And I'm trolling for Great Northern Pike. Now, how you troll for Great Northern Pike is you troll just outside of a weed bed. And you just troll. Now, how you troll, you just let your boat drift there, it's because there was a pretty fast current in this lake, and there was a river down at the other end, so that you'd move quickly through the lake. So I'm trolling along, and I'm towing the silver spoon, and on fairly light tackle. When all of a sudden, out of the out of the depths, this lake is a dark, almost black water at this time of the year, heavy chopping waves. Something rolled just rolled next to the boat, just came right to the surface and rolled, just went, just rolled, and the water just sort of moved around it, just like a, a, a small, well, it rolled, whatever it was, it just rolled to the surface and went down. What the hell? And it was not a fish, it was smooth. It just sort of rolled like that and big. Well, at that point, now, there I was, I'm on this lake all by myself. See? <laughs> I look around. Now, I'm not that type. I'm not a chicken type. I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, you know, the kind of guy that, uh, that walks away from physical danger. Never have been. I, you know, maybe that's foolish, but never have been. So this thing rolled, just rolled right next to the boat. And so much so that it made a wake like, it made a little, not wake really, but, but water, uh, the waves moved and, and, and it hit the side of the canoe and just rolled. And I saw it there in, the, in that curious light, but then it went under and it was gone, completely gone. Well, I trolled for a couple of minutes. I couldn't figure out what the hell this was, see, and I, and I reeled in, and I, I picked up the paddle, and I, I paddled around the area there for a while. I watched for something. Nothing. Never came up again. Well, at that point, I was a little bit, let's say, mystified. And a couple of more days went by, and it kept getting, strangely enough, Every day, it kept getting darker out there. Instead of it being light, it was getting, I figured, well, it was just getting cloudy. It was getting darker and darker. And, and it was kind of a gloom around everything. And then it happened. I had a radio with me, a portable battery-operated radio. I woke up one morning, And it was dark in the cabin, as it always was. This cabin was dark. Anyway, there were trees around. I woke up in the morning, turned the radio on, and the radio's playing. 
And I walked out the door that had a little short, flat, wooden porch. And it is night. It was nighttime. I figured, what the hell? Did, this, you know, I figured, this, what's, what's the matter? It, 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 did, did, I, did I sleep an hour and wake up? It's night. It's night. I mean, black night. It is night. Night. You can't see your hand in front of your head. It's dark. Night. I walked back into the cabin, thinking, well, you know, I must have just slept an hour. I, I can't figure it out. It's still night. But the radio is on, and I hear this guy come on, on this Detroit radio station, with the 11 a.m. news. I can't believe it. It's 11 o'clock in the morning. And he's talking about that afternoon. The, the Detroit uh, Lions are playing the Green Bay Packers, and they're going to carry the game something like 12.30 in the afternoon. The game is going to be picked up. And I walk back down. It's completely black, and I can see stars overhead. I couldn't believe it. And I walked down to the shore of the lake, and it was pitch dark. It's night, 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 just like it's night now. And I went out on the little short dock and I had out there. And my boat was bobbing in the water. I looked around. I says, what the hell's going on? Am I, am, I, am I flipping my lid? What's happening to me? It's, it's, it's 12.30 in the afternoon. I had my radio with me. I was carrying it down there. I, 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 it was my only contact with the outside world. And look at it. It's dark. It's night. I can see stars out. Sure enough, the football game came on. And wherever it was, it was in Detroit. The sun was shining. Because they didn't mention the fact that it was night in Detroit. It was night where I was. Mysterious scene. I went back into the cabin, and I said, geez, it's time for breakfast or lunch or something. But it's night out. By 3 o'clock that afternoon, it vaguely began to get light. And by 4.30, it was twilight. And by 5 o'clock that afternoon, it was beginning to get dark again. And now we were into night. We'd lost a complete day. The sun never came up on Rifle Lake in Michigan. It wasn't until two months later that I discovered why that happened. And it actually did happen. I'm not kidding.